my uh, my dad just passed away uh, on Christmas Day, and he had to go uh, get the dialysis in the hospital. He was in the hospital for like two months, and I know how much time that takes. Um, so what you do it every what Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Monday through Friday? Is that the deal? Uh, I used to do it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then. I finally got to go to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which is what I wanted to do the entire time. It took me five years to get to that. And then I got married and I wanted to do this the whole time, but I couldn't do it on my own because I'm blind and I can't see everything that I have to do. And if I got an infection, I wouldn't know it. So uh, I got married and then I've got a wife. We both went through training and we started this about six months ago. And when you do dialysis, well, you know, your dad was exhausted. He it took it beat him up. Yes, it did. The next day he'd be exhausted. And then it's time to start over. And and you never catch up. You never catch you feel like if you could just go without it one day, you could catch up on your sleep, but you can't. Even the one day that you get to go off of it you know that you've got to come right back to it. So when I do it this way, it's Monday through Friday. It's five days a week. Uh, it's anywhere from two and a half hours to three and a half hours. But oh. my, my energy level is so high that I used to wake up every day at 4 a.m. And I would set my alarm and I'd get up at four and I, I pray all my intentions then I pray a 20 decade rosary. Then I pray another set of intentions and I pray another 20 decade rosary. And then I pray one single intention and I pray a five decade rosary. Now. That's amazing. You know, and I don't have to set my alarm for that. I go to bed and I sleep for about two to three hours. And then I wake up and I'm awake the rest of the night. So since I'm up, it's rosary time. So I pull out my 20 decker rosaries and just pretty much go to town. I pray them as slow as I want and put as much emphasis on things as I want, concentrate extra on certain things, and just enjoy the night with rosaries. Then during the day, um, the last nine days, it ended yesterday, we were doing three novenas three nine-day novenas, and with each novena, I do a five-decade rosary. So we got wow. to do three, three five-decade rosaries a day with three different intentions. And now, uh, this time around, we're doing four nine-day novenas. So we started it today, and we got to do four rosaries earlier today. And then, usually around 6 p.m. every day, well, it won't happen today but because of this interview, but normally at around 6 p.m., my wife and my kids join us and we pray a family rosary. So kids, how many kids do you have? Three. Oh. And what are their ages, if you don't mind me asking? Um, seven, eight, and 15. Wow. Wow. Um, and a dog? <laughs> dog named Hinata. Ah, cool. It, How old is the dog? Uh, she'll be one in May. Oh, no. I've been wanting to get a dog, but I can't quite pull the trigger on it. It's a big responsibility, you know? It is. Yeah. Um, she has um, pads in the house so that she can go in the house. Oh. She actually doesn't want to poop outside. And she only really wants to be outside if there's snow on the ground. Ah, if there's snow on the really? ground, she's loved, she loves it. She loves to play in the snow. Um, if it's hot, she'll look outside and decide, no. Nah. <laughs> not worth it. Not going outside. Well, uh, and you're, you, where are you living now? I don't want to assume that it's the same place that I thought you lived. Which dog? Okay, that's what I thought. It gets hot down there, so I'm sure, I'm sure your dog's like, "Yep, yeah, I'm gonna stay in here in the air conditioning." Yeah, yeah, she, she's pretty much like that. It only snowed twice this year, and uh, yeah, she right. Was very, she was disappointed because 
she wants to go outside and frolic. She's um, oh, American Eskimo miniature. Oh. So in a big uh, snowbank, I... you can't see her. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. I had to move my stool. Hang on a second, because I just need to. I'm at a high top, high top kind of table with a really bad stool. So I had to change my direction. Okay. So hi to your wife. I want to thank her for helping get you all set up and, you know, taking great care of you before this. And thanks for being flexible for today as well. I just think it's an awesome day to be doing this interview because this was the day that Say that again. I didn't say anything. But oh, she, she said you're welcome. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. Anyway, I just think it's an awesome day to be doing this interview because it's Good Friday and this is the day that Jesus whacked Satan in the face and took away death and sin. And I just think it's perfect. And oh, if I could pull myself together, I was bawling at the veneration of the cross. It was pretty crazy. One of okay. my I have a lot of Catholic t-shirts and um, I think I'm wearing one now. Well, what's this one? Uh, St. Catherine of Siena. Um, nice. I think I've got Mary Undoer of Knots. I've got um, one that says I'm a mama's boy. <laughs> That's cute. I like that. Um, I have two ministries now. And one of my ministries, our mission statement is our mother wears combat boots. Ah, nice. Is it? Do you sell those shirts too? Uh, no, we don't. We we, we might start though. Um, we have uh, the name of that ministry. It's kind of funny. It's Our Lady of Guadalupe's Army. O L G A. Olga, so yeah. When, okay. when we joke about the ministry, we call it Olga. And I'm like, it is such an ugly name for a beautiful ministry. Uh, I, I I have a very big devotion to Our Lady. Uh, she healed me from marijuana addiction a couple times, actually, uh, because I fell back into it. Long story. This isn't about me. But yes, I love Our Lady of Guadalupe. Amazing. Amazing. All right, so should we kind of get started? What do you think? Sure. Okay, let's pray first. Um, because otherwise, we'll, all the good conversation will happen right here. And then right. we'll think, oh, record this. Right, well, it is recording. So I've got that going for us. Um, you know, if we wanted to slice some of this stuff in here. Um, but let's pray. I've got a little statue of Mary with me. I've got some holy water. And it's right. just, you know, I'm pretty sure Satan doesn't want this coming out. So let's pray over the technology and pray that the Holy Spirit lead us because I do want this to be free form. Um, even though we have some questions uh, that I forwarded to you just so that you were kind of having an idea where we go. Let's make sure that the Spirit leads us. So let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for giving us your only begotten son who came down to earth as a man and God who today on Good Friday killed Satan's plans of sin and also of death. And so today we ask you, Jesus, to pour your precious blood all over both me and Zachary as we talk about evil and the spiritual battle. Mary our Blessed Mother, please wrap us in your blue mantle. Please keep us protected from any technology issues, any problems that may come our way, and keep the evil one out of this time together so that we can bring truth to everyone to help us fight the spiritual battle with your rosary, Mary, and Jesus with your precious blood and your Eucharist in the Holy Catholic Church. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. All right. So we're going to get started for everyone that's joining us. This is Zachary King. He is a, what I understand, is a former high wizard, which is a Satanist. And we will talk about all about what that is, who 
who was saved from our blessed mother. And we'll get to that at the end because we don't want to spoil it right now. So Zachary, uh, tell us a little bit about your younger age. And I'm going to put a link here so that everybody can see the EWTN interview and the LifeSite News interview that you can get more detail on your childhood. But I just kind of want to cut to the chase of how you kind of got into this coven. And by the way, before we even get into what that coven was, can you explain what a coven is? A coven is a group. Uh, generally, it's a group of witches or Satanists. But I suppose almost any group could be called a coven. Uh, it's a group that gets together for usually a, an intended purpose. Um, but Wiccans consider their group a coven. Now, there are different definitions as to how big a coven should be. Um, some witches and Satanists claim that a coven has to be 13 members. Hmm. Uh, some people say it has to be any number. It can be as big as you want. Uh, the Satanic Temple, uh, year before last, at SatanCon in Arizona, they claim that they have 300,000 members worldwide. SatanCon. So there's an actual conference that these people go to in Arizona. Right. I've heard about that, but I didn't know it was that big. Uh, I mean, I'm sure they don't all attend, right? What's that? I'm sure they don't all attend that conference, but you're saying that you think that the... Um, well, this is by... Um, what's his name? Lucian... Greaves. Lucian Greaves is the high priest and the founder. And last year, Satan Khan was in Boston, and they claim that they now have 700,000 members worldwide. Wow. And that the majority of their members are trans. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Well, these That's are not something that we're going to say these that are again. People that these are people that not necessarily worship Satan. They just are mad at God for something. Mm. That's one of my questions when we get there. Okay. So thanks for clearing up that coven thing, because I had to look it up. I never heard the word before until I watched your interviews. And I, I just didn't know, because I think you said that yours in your town was somewhere around 120 to 150 people at any given time. Right. And so I just didn't understand the gist of that. So can you explain how did you get into this coven with, um, as a child, you were what, 10 years old? You were really into magic? Is that somehow? Yeah, I, the, it, it, I, I was watching uh, Doug Henning and Illusionist on television. And I knew that was fake. And there was also, I knew about Anton LaVey and the Satanic Bible, but I couldn't get my hands on one of those. I At 10, you knew about that? I knew about that, yeah. It's mentioned wow. on television. Somebody said it on television, and I thought, I wonder if that's a real thing. Oh, okay. And, and I think I was even on a sitcom. It was like, just a regular show, and this guy said, "What are you reading, Anton Lavey's Satanic Bible?" You know, and I thought, "Anton Lavey's Satanic Bible." I'm gonna have to find that out. I went to the library, and we didn't have one. However, my dad took me to, I think it was Walden Books, in West Palm Beach, Florida, and I went searching, and on the religious aisle, I found Anton Lavey's Satanic Bible, and it was. I think it was like $3.99. I didn't have $3.99. And my dad would have also wondered, what are you buying? <laughs> yeah, right. And then he beat me to death in Walden Books. But at least I knew the book was real. So I went about, I was Baptist. I grew up Baptist. I was in my diapers in the Baptist church. So at 10 years old, I'm going to church every Sunday. And I asked my Baptist preacher, is magic real? Is that something that anybody can do? And I also asked my parents and both said no, that magic is fake. Magic is sleight of hand, card tricks, pulling a rabbit out of a hat, um, 
magic isn't something you can really do. Now, somehow, my Baptist preacher and my parents miss the 33 verses in the Bible where God tells you not to do magical things. In the Old Testament, you're stoned to death. In the New Testament, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. Now, if it was impossible to lie, thou shalt not lie would not be in the Bible. But thou shalt not lie is in the Bible once. Thou shalt not kill is in the Bible once. Thou shalt not steal is in the Bible once. You should not do magic is in there 33 times. So I would think, one, it is possible to do magic, and two, it's very, very, very important that you do not do it. Now, we're I, talking magic with a K versus magic with magic a C? With a K, correct. Magic with a C is sleight of hand, illusion, Doug Henning. So for, so for kids um, that are trying to get into magic with a C, are you saying, you know what, don't even mess with that either, or that's okay? Well, as long as you see, you know the difference. Because magic with a K is satanic magic. Now, it's satanic even if the person practicing it doesn't believe in the devil. So Wiccans don't believe in God, the devil, heaven, or hell. They don't believe in angels or demons. They believe that they have the hidden knowledge it takes to, when somebody dies, their spirit circles the planet. And so they have the hidden knowledge it takes to tap into that person, and that person is who helps them do magic. And sometimes you tap into Gandhi, and sometimes you tap into Hitler. So sometimes you get a good spirit, sometimes you get a bad one. It just depends on what your abilities are. Wow, so, I did not do that. I did not know that. Thank you for that little education. So when I was looking to do magic, well, actually a couple of years ago, I had a caretaker that said he would give me ten thousand dollars if I could prove magic was real. I was like, all right, come over to my house. I'll prove it. So he came over to my house, and I showed him 33 verses in the Bible that tell you not to do it. I said, why would God tell you not to do something if it was impossible to do? I am right. still waiting for my $10,000. <laughs> I didn't prove it to him. He wanted me to actually do a magic spell. I'm like, you know, right. that's a mortal thing, right? You know, that, that's yeah. something that will send you to hell if you don't go to confession. So, so talk talk to me. Okay, keep going. Keep going. I'll interrupt you in I a decide, sec. I decide that adults don't know everything. My, I've caught my dad in things that were wrong, where he thought this was accurate. He didn't think he was lying to me. He just thought that he knew what he was talking about, and he didn't. So I thought, maybe this is one of those times. Maybe I could do a magic spell. Now, if I do it, I'm not going to tell anybody I'm doing it because I'm a little nerdy kid. I get made fun of enough as it is. So I'm not going to tell anybody, but I'm going to try it. And if it works, I know something that no adult knows. And if it doesn't work, no one has to ever know that I tried it. So, so what was this first trick of yours? Well, you know, I was thinking I'm not a big fan of of the the pop quiz I get every Friday. But I know if I make the teacher, let's say I break the teacher's leg or something, I'd cause harm to come to her, we'll get another teacher. And they might be worse. I also am not a big fan of my PE coach. But again, they'll just hire a new PE coach. So I don't want to hurt somebody. But I thought, you know, some cash would be nice. You know, my favorite things in the world are candy bars, which are 15 to 20 cents, comic books, which are 15 to 20 cents, and penny candy, which is a penny. For a dollar four, I can have 100 pieces of candy. So I do a magic spell, and I do it for money. 
And, uh, and I got so what do you, what, what did the spell, like, how did you find this spell? What did, I mean, did, tell me what that kind of entailed at I 10. Was playing, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons and our, our TSR gaming books had magic spells in them. Now it, it is said that the founders of D and D went to real Satanists and said, Hey, we want some real spells to make the game feel authentic. So they were given real spells and we were able to just mimic those spells. And, you know, we did spells, if we were going to go on a campaign and I was going to be a wizard or a sorcerer, we would need to do a spell to find jewelry or to find gemstones or gold or diamonds so we could do our campaign. So I just used the same spell for that to look for real money. And so I did that on a Friday. Saturday, I went out to play. And I found, we had a tennis tournament in town. And I found a can of tennis balls on the ground. And I picked it up, had three tennis balls in it, and a $5 bill. Now, this is 1976. Everything I want is dirt cheap. And with a $5 bill, and 20 more cents, I can buy 500 pieces of candy. Right. Sure. But somebody had to find that can. It could have just as easily been somebody else. So next Friday, I do it again. And Saturday, I go out and I go playing. And there's a couple of people walking in front of me and a couple of people walking behind me. We're walking through a neighborhood, and I happened to look down in the grass and saw a $10 bill. And I picked that up because that's a thousand pieces of candy. And, and I put that in my pocket, and I'm like, yeah, this is working out well. But the people in front of me could have seen that. And the person behind me might have seen it had I not seen it. So I'm still thinking this could be a coincidence. I'm going to try it one more time. Now, at school at this time, I'm in the fifth grade. On the first day of the fifth grade, this kid came up to me and he said, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. Well, my parents haven't warned me. If somebody ever comes up to you and says, meet me in the bathroom, don't go. <laughs> they never said that. I don't know. We're innocent. We don't have the internet. You don't have, you know, yeah. you can't, you can't access porn on your phone. You know, there's not, you know, all the stuff that there is now, you know, we didn't have any of that back then. Apparently we didn't have a lot of common sense either. So <laughs> I walked in the bathroom. It was 10, 20 time for the first break. And this kid's in there with 49 other kids. There's boys and girls in the same bathroom. You know, I walk in and, they're like, all right, I think everybody's here. So what we're going to do is turn out the light and we're going to chant this phrase a certain number of times. And if you do it right, the spirit of a burn victim will show up in the mirror. And I mean, this sounds like a load of hogwash to me. Yeah. But I'm in a bathroom with 49 other kids. Sure, let's see what happens. And they turn out the lights. Now, the first thing is that some 10 year olds are still afraid of the dark. So there's a little apprehension going on there. And then we chant our phrase a certain number of times. And all of a sudden, this scary face appears in the mirror. And 49 kids run screaming out of the bathroom. One child. Except that it, one stupid kid. <laughs> call him stupid because it was me. Stayed yeah. in the bathroom. This is cool. I did this. I chanted the phrase X number of times. I made the face appear. Now, in, in, in the realm of stupid things you're not thinking of, that mirror is not some distant land 10,000 miles away that you've just tapped into. It's not even the room on the other side of the mirror. If you're right. seeing the reflection, it's standing next to you. 
So I've that got is an deals. awesome point. That is an awesome point. Okay, keep going. I've got a demon standing next to me, but I'm not aware of it. I'm not smart enough. Apparently, I'm not the sharpest stack in the box. And um, I tell people I'm, I was as sharp as a marble. So <laughs> I'm seeing that, that they ended up sending notes home from school because kids got hurt in their haste to leave the bathroom. And I don't mean like, you know, shoved around, bumped and bruised hurt. I mean, broken arm, broken leg hurt. And I had to go to my dad in the den and tell him, uh, yeah, we've got this note from school. I need your signature. I need to take it back to school. Normally, he takes it, signs it, hands it back to me, never reads it. Today, he takes it and reads it. And I'm standing there sweating bullets because I play this game every day. The only reason I stopped is because they said if we we're caught playing it, we'd be suspended for three days. And he gets a look on his face and in his usual loving tone, ask me, have you been playing this game? <laughs> Being terrified of my dad as I was, I told him the absolute truth. Nope. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now you're going to do this at home. I'm going to fast forward through it because I know yep. people can get the beats and the other one. All right, so now you're like, fine, I won't do it at school. I'll do it at home. And you're doing it all the time, all the time, all the time. And every single time this burn victim's face or this demon, let's be honest, yep. is showing right. itself. And what is that doing to you? Is it just giving you like this idea of power? It has given me, I'm not sure if this is a magic spell or not, but it seems to be. I mean, what, what I didn't realize at that time is to make magic real, you need intention, repetition, and demonic presence. So I've had kids tell me- I, All right, tried. wait, wait, erase, go back, or rewind, I should say. Tell those three things again. Intention. In order for magic, intention. Repetition. Demonic presence. Demonic presence. Take note, parents. Okay, go ahead. So I've had kids tell me I've tried Harry Potter spells over and over again, and they don't work. So I will praise God that meant there wasn't a demon present, but you still need to go to confession because magic is a mortal sin. But I've also had kids tell me they did work, and that's scary. That meant there was a demon present when you did your magic spell. Did you so hear you don't the, conjure up the demon when you're doing the spell? You just It has to be somewhere around you? Is that what you're saying? It, it has to be, it has to know what you're doing for it to show up in the mirror, for it to be next to you. If you're doing it and the demon's not near you, it's not gonna show up. And that never happened to you? You always did it? He always was there? Yeah, which meant he was probably staying with me. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so go ahead. Did you hear, I heard this last year, um, J.K. Rowling wrote a note and put it on her website. I heard it since then been taken down, but I was in another interview and that guy was able to look it up and found it and posted it in his podcast. And it's where J.K. Rowling's apologized um, and said that every time she cashed, every time she deposited one of her billion dollar Harry Potter checks, she felt guilty because she was lying. She felt like she was lying to Gaia, Mother Earth, that the Wiccan religion is the one true church, that's the true faith, and that you wrote Harry Potter books to mislead young people to believe magic was real so that they would join the Wiccan faith because it's a dying religion. All the elderly people in it are starting to die off and there's no young people to refresh in it. But now, thanks to the books and the movies, there's been an influx of young people into the Wiccan religion. I did not hear, I've heard other stuff about her, but I did not hear that. Interesting. 
I, I heard that like she had something writing for her. If you heard that, that I don't know what she had. Um, she asked for, she asked to be possessed through automatic writing, and then uh, I heard Father. I heard it was Father Chad Ripiger did an exorcism, and the demon identified himself as one of the six, and he didn't know what one of the six meant, so he asked for clarification. And he was one of the six demons that possessed J.K. Rowling and wrote her book for him. Wow. There's... Um, what, what were the other five? I don't know. But there was okay. um, a 2019 BBC interview between a guy named John and J.K. Rowling. And the interview was done on Christmas Day. And this guy that interviewed for the, for the podcast found this as well and put it on his podcast because the BBC took it down. But it, it was her being interviewed. And he said, well, Miss Rowling isn't most of the pushback you get from the United States because they believe Harry Potter is satanic. And she said, it is satanic. It absolutely is satanic. I'm glad that you've given me this platform that I can finally say it. I can finally admit it to the world. Harry Potter is satanic. And she said, my Thomas or publicist or somebody that she travels with for interviews, it has her head in her hands, shaking her head no right now that I wasn't supposed to say this. Uh, well, yeah, duh. <laughs> But, but but I thought it was witches, or they were casting witchcraft or Wiccans or something. So how is that satanic? Or are they the same? That's the thing that I'm confused about when we use satanic well, to describe that. All magic is satanic. It doesn't matter how you got it. It's satanic. God doesn't do magic. Satan does magic. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe in Satan or not. If you're practicing magic, it's demons that are doing your magic for you. It's Satan that's helping you along. It doesn't matter that you don't believe in Satan. You don't believe in hell. You don't believe in demons. You don't believe in any of that stuff. It doesn't matter. Satan believes in you. Okay. So really, when you're talking about magic, that's casting spells, casting curses, and that type of stuff. Is that what we mean? Or is it... Right. Doing something that, you know, it's not the sleight of hand magic that you see where people disappear and they, you know, get themselves untangled from something in right. water, and, you know, like the Houdini right. kind of M -A -G -I -C -K. stuff. M-A-G-I-C-K. Satanic magic. Yeah, but like the actual Satanic. act. Describe what, what. Sorry, I keep talking over you. Say that again. Uh, differentiated by Aleister Crowley, who decided around 1904 that he should change the spelling of magic so we'd know if it was sleight of hand or satanic magic, real magic. Okay. So let's go back to you at 10. And how did you get involved in this coven? Of course, you're still doing this I don't know, magic spell or whatever it was to get this face to show up all the time. And how did you get into that coven? Um, well, being 10 years old, I was, I had done, I did a third spell and it was for magic, but I did this one in the bathroom at home and halfway into the spell, I did the Bloody Mary chant and the face showed up, and then I let the face know that I was doing a spell for money. I held up cash and showed it everything that I was using, the candles I was using, and the knife I was using, and the parchment, so we could see I'm doing a spell. And the next day I went out, and I was in a large unpaved parking lot for U.S. Sugar. It was a plug for U.S. Sugar, and um, not really. And... Um, it's, um, I saw something shiny up in the distance, like really shiny, very bright. And I ran off to see what that was. When I got there, there was nothing like that. There was nothing shiny, nothing bright. 
But I reached out and I, I saw what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. So I put that in my pocket and went back to playing. And later that night, everybody's taking their baths, everybody's eating dinner, everybody's in bed, everybody's going to sleep. I'm in my room, lights are out, sheet is up over my head, flashlight in my mouth. And I'm unraveling all the rubber bands to see what I've got. And it looked like Monopoly money because I'd never seen a $100 bill. And when I unraveled all of them, I had 10 $100 bills. That's a whole lot of candy. That's 100,000 pieces of candy. And that's not <laughs> what I spent it on, but I could have. And that was like a fat nerdy kid's dream come true. Uh, now at this time, I'm also playing D&D, &D, campaigns of D&D &D every weekend, usually with older kids, a lot of high schoolers. Uh, there wasn't a lot of kids my age. There was one other kid my age that played. And then at 10 years old, he just disappeared. He stopped going to church. He stopped going to school. And I just assumed that he moved away. When I was 11 years old, I was uh, became the survivor of an, uh, a sexual assault at school at the hands of a female teacher who told me that it was my idea. I wanted to do it. Uh, and if I told anybody, I would go to prison, I would be expelled from school, my parents would kick me out of the house, and she made it seem like all this would happen in one year. And then when I got out of prison, I wouldn't be allowed to live at home, and I'd have to get a job and support myself. So she's a teacher, why would she lie to me? Mm -hmm. So I just assumed she was telling the truth, so I didn't tell anybody, you know, what happened to me now initially when that happened i got a, a note from the teacher to go to the bathroom who asked me why didn't i go to the bathroom in between classes well because my other class is pe and it's the other side of the building i only have three minutes to make it from there to here i didn't have time to go to the bathroom you put me in detention if i'd have gone so i go to the bathroom this happens to me, I leave the bathroom, I still haven't gone to the bathroom. <laughs> so when I get back to the room, which I was there for a while in the bathroom, when I come back, then the teacher asked me if I enjoyed myself in the bathroom. And I didn't know if that meant, because, and then she made a comment about having diarrhea. I must have had diarrhea because I was in there so long. Mm. And I don't know if she thought that I had diarrhea or did she know what was happening to me in the bathroom. And then when Maybe the school... she was in, it, in on it, right? There's 120 to 150 people in this coven. Could be all over the town. I don't know. So then yeah. when the class ends, that's my last class of the day. <laughs> so I've got to go to the bathroom but I'm scared to go to the bathroom at school. You know, I'm thinking she might still be in another bathroom. All right. Now I've got to walk home and I've got to pee really bad. So on my way home, I peed myself. And then I got home with my clothes in the clothes hamper. My mother never said anything about it because I'd have been more trauma. But that night when I took a bath, I made it as hot as I possibly could to get in it because I was trying to clean whatever was on me off of me. Yeah. And it was like that for many days. And then there was a while that I considered drinking bleach, not to kill myself. No, to clean yourself. To clean myself. Ah. Oh. I felt like I was dirty inside. And the only thing that gave me wow. comfort and solace was magic. Magic made me feel on top of the world. I felt like I could do anything because my magic spells worked. Even if they were just for money, Hot Wheels cars, Matchbox cars, comic books, candy. Even if they were simple stuff that a little kid would want, it right. still worked. It still worked. And I had no power in that bathroom. 
So at 12 years old, this kid that we thought had moved away, moved back. He started going to church again, came to school and started playing D&D again. And he told us about this group that he hangs out with that plays D&D every weekend and they believe magic is real. Well, I know magic is real. So I'm thinking maybe I'll go check these guys out. And I asked him, where did he move to? And he said, I didn't move anywhere. I've been here the whole time. It's like, you didn't hang out with us? Are we like the town lepers or something? Like, what, what's wrong with you? And he said that he had a new set of friends and he was just becoming friends with them. He was homeschooled. And we knew kids that were homeschooled. So we knew they had their own little cliques and stuff. So, you know, we understood that. What we didn't get and what I didn't realize until I was an adult is that he was a satanic recruiter. Recru right. He recruited kids. You know, we wouldn't have got that at 12 years old. So, so do you so, think like during that two years that he was gone, that he was being groomed or, you know, trained yeah. to do this? And do you think his parents were, were aware of this? I would assume yes, if he's not going to regular school. Yeah, they were. Okay. Ah, okay. So, see, that's one of the things that, you know, when you're letting your kids, you need to find out not just who the kid is, your parent, your kids are hanging out with, but who the parents are. Yes. My, my parents let me go to this group because they knew almost everybody there. What they yeah. didn't know is that everybody there was a Satanist. <laughs> How could that be, right? I mean, I, I so they knew everyone because nice. your town was small? Yeah, my town was small. I think we probably had like, when I was really young, we had about 3,500 people there. Hmm. And even now, I mean, if you looked up my, my own town, I'm pretty sure the population isn't very big. So wow. this, kid, this kid tells us about this group and they've got a in-ground swimming pool and an in-ground barbecue pit and they've got a bunch of movies and they've got a 50-inch a projection screen TV and they've got reel-to-reel -reel movies and they've also got this machine that plays movies, you know, and I'm like, all right, let's go check them out, see what they got. Now, at my house, during the summer, I could get three meals a day and a snack if my mom was in a good mood. Mm. And that snack is going to be healthy. She's going to hand you grapes or carrots or something like that. You might get lucky and it'd be crackers and cheese, but not very lucky. Okay. Over there, yeah. you know, I had five pizzas in my life, my entire life living at home. Five store wow. bought pizza. Store bought, not not bought at a restaurant. Right. Bought bought at Winn Dixie or Publix or whatever the store was, whatever the grocery store was. Um, but over there, I could have pizza every night if I wanted it. I could have if we got a Burger King and McDonald's in town, they would get us food if we wanted. And anything I wanted, I could get. You know at any time that I wanted it. Uh, they had a pantry that was filled with like a hundred boxes of candy. You don't have to ask permission. You just go in there, take whatever you want. There's no reason to take five or six at a time. Just go in and take one at a time. Right, because you got access to it all the time. You can go back in there and get another one. It doesn't matter. Just take whatever you want. It's all free anything you want. Now, being there, I tried my first cigarette and I found out that cigarettes taste great after you've had a good meal. So do cigars. You're drinking wine with your meal. Camaraderie with a group of friends over a football game is a perfect place to drink a beer. Now, keep in mind, my parents do not know of any of this. 
And my dad, being Baptist, drinks like one beer every year. He buys a single beer. I don't know what the special occasion is, but he drinks it once a year. So can and I butt in real quick it, and just ask about like this place? So is it someone's house? Is it a big warehouse? How many other kids are there type of thing? It, it's a big house. Um, there's anywhere from, I'd say the least amount of kids I ever saw there was 10. And the most I ever saw was probably about 75. 75 in a big house? How big is this house? It's pretty big. Okay. All right. But but we're hanging out. I mean, we're, like, you know, at my, move, my house, we could watch a G-rated movie. So we watched a lot of Disney. And a PG-rated movie, if it had been vetted by my dad first. But over there... I found out there were R-rated movies. I didn't know that existed. And there were X-rated movies. And there were triple X-rated movies. And there were triple X-rated movies with kids in at my age. Some younger, some older, but kids. And I'm like, I didn't know this existed. I've never seen this in my house. You know, and they're like, here, watch. They handed me a stack. These are like real to real. And, you know, they said, go through, pick the names and just give us which one you want to see. So I, you know, went through the names didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So I was like, Here, I'll watch this one. I don't know what this is. And they said certain letters depict uh, certain types of sex. So then they would explain what that meant. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to see that, you know, or I do want to see that. And we'd watch it and some of the kids in those videos I've seen in this house. Oh, I was going to ask that. Thanks for bringing that up. Oh, okay. And they told in the, me in rooms in that house too, right? What's or that? No? Are they, being, are they in this, are they in the rooms in that house or are they being recorded in another place and you're just watching them, but yet they've been in that house. If that makes sense. They're usually they're usually being recorded someplace else. Okay. So, but I've seen them. I recognize their faces. Like the girl that's in the room with me watching the video is in the video we're watching. Oh gosh. And so they told me that what happened to me when I was eleven was horrible. I should have never happened to anybody. And I told somebody that I trusted, this is what happened to me when I was 11. And they said, that was horrible. That should have never happened to anybody. But now you can get your power back. Now, first off, let's say that we don't have any power. That, that's a lie of the devil. Right. We don't have power. But I was 12 years old, and I believe that I did. And I believe that I lost it when I was sexually assaulted. And I felt hollow inside, empty. Like I wasn't the same person anymore. Right. And so they told me that now I can do that kind of stuff anytime I want. Or if somebody wants to do it and I don't, I can say no. And they'll make me famous. They'll put me in movies like that and other kids will watch. And what happened is that we would do a movie. Now we did movies, loops, vids, and stills. So each one of those depicts a different thing that's being recorded, except stills. Those are photos. So, yeah. and a loop is a seven minute loop. So, I mean, that could be uh, a 70 minute movie, but they chop it into seven minute loops. And okay. then people will the individual loop and they'll pay pretty big money for that as well as vids are about a half an hour and then movies are an hour and a half or longer so and people pay big money but this was the thing every time I watched one of those movies there might have been one adult in the room 
but usually it was an older kid that put the movie on. And then mm. it was all in the room that watched it. So for that reason, I believed that the person that was buying this, because I had unlimited money. I could do magic spells for money. And I was, I was always in the money. So as far as I knew, some kid in some other part of the world was doing magic spells for money, making money and buying our loops and bids and tapes because they would tell about how much money they're making, how many they're selling. And we'd get these notes. We'd get a note written on, I don't know how old you are. I'm 57. So we used I'm to 53. Have, <laughs> you remember the child notebook paper? Yeah. It was like wide, wide instead of long, instead of tall. Yeah. And the, the, the lines were bigger. And you wrote with a big fat pencil. Yep. And so it'd be sent to us in like crayon. And all of our names, it was a fake name, but all of our names are displayed next to our picture in the movie. So I was Tommy. And people would ask for Tommy to be seen with whoever. And they want to see these acts done. Oh, and this is so far back. I mean, you know, you think of this today, but this was like a long time ago. How many people were pedophiles? Or this is 1978 that I got involved. Actually, what happened in in 78? I was 12. Um, I was told that I was going to go to this house, take this note. They seal the an envelope with a note in it. And they said, we want you to go to this house, knock on the door. When they answer it, whoever answers, give them this note. They'll open it and read it. And they'll know what to do. I was like, okay. So I went to this house. It was just a few houses back from mine. I knew the, the kids that were in it. And I knocked on the door and they spoke to me. They knew me. And I handed them the envelope. And they opened it, called their other siblings over. And they had an eight-year-old sister, an 11-year-old sister, and a 14-year-old sister. And then they also had an older brother. And all of these kids had been involved in child pornography since they were three years old. And their mother had been involved in child pornography as well. And then she got pregnant and had these four kids. And then she got all of her kids involved in child pornography. So I started training with the eight-year-old first. And I trained with her for about a month. And then I went to the 11-year-old. And she had me with her for about two weeks. And then I went to the 14-year-old who had me for about a week. When I was with the youngest girl, the back door opened up. And I knew that's how her mother comes in. And I was terrified oh. and she knocked on her, on her daughter's door. And I thought I'm going to die. She's going <laughs> to walk in the door, either kill me or run me to my dad's house or run to my dad's house. And then my dad's going to kill me. Right. No doubt. Of course, a normal parent would do this, right? Right. Oh. And she opened the door and she spoke to me and she said, how are the lessons going? Oh. And she said, yeah. He's pretty good. He's, he's picking up on it fast. She was okay. And then she asked me if I could stay for dinner. And I said, I'd have to call my dad. She goes, I'll call your dad. Don't worry about it. Oh, so I went back. You know, my, my heart rose back up from my stomach. And I, I told this girl, I said, I thought I was going to be in trouble. She goes, oh, don't be ridiculous. Our whole family's involved. So, but wow. their dad... Their dad was no longer in the picture. And um, so I got my training from each of them. And once I spent the week with the oldest one, then I went back to my coven and said, they said I passed. And they're like, great, now, now you can be in movies. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. now, at this time, too, you said a beer. 
but you were also into a lot of drugs because I would think that that would help with this whole thing, right? Well, it, it gets you, sometimes you're a little, you know, the first couple of times you're on camera, it's like, somebody is really filming that camera? And it's like, people are really going to be watching this? So they'd have you like smoke a joint or two and get nice and relaxed. Um, have a beer, calm your nerves, take a couple of shots. Um, you know, we did, um, I was trying, like, my dad had told me when I was growing up that drugs will kill you. Smoking pot will kill you. Um, don't ever take your first drink because you might be an alcoholic. Well, I wasn't an alcoholic because I drank all the time, but I could stop any time. You know, I used to go to school. My mom would give me a large cup of orange juice. Halfway to school, I would stop in at a house, and they would fill it the rest of the way with vodka. And then I would go to class drinking orange juice and vodka as a screwdriver, but it looks like orange juice. Right. And the, I'm making straight A's pretty much at school. So the teachers are like, oh, it's just a large thing of OJ. And they call my mom one time and ask, did you send your son to school with this? Yes. It's OJ. Okay. Yeah, and then, I mean, I'm 12 years old. Where would I get vodka? Right. So, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not realizing that I'm not, I'm not sick because I've got a fever. I'm sick because I'm, I'm stoned. You know, I'm, I've taken, um, I've drank about six ounces of vodka and smoked a joint before school. Um, you know, I'm taking, there's this salad bowl where it's got like, I don't know, 500 pills in it. And you just take whatever. And you don't know what any of them do. So experiment. So this one makes everything brighter. And this one makes everything darker. And this one makes you hyper. And this one puts you to sleep. And this one makes you feel like you're slipping into a coma. And this one makes you hallucinate. And I found out my favorite drugs of choice I loved mushrooms, I loved acid, I loved weed, and I loved to take MDMA with acid, and it was called candy flipping. And probably a couple of years ago, I was on YouTube, and I looked up candy flipping to see what comes up. And there's a guy on YouTube that's recorded himself on MDMA and acid. And I oh. couldn't watch it. I couldn't watch it because it put me right back into that state. Really? And I felt like I was on it. I felt like I was on it. I was like, oh, I got uh, <laughs> got to change this. <laughs> so apparently I did it a little too much. And it's, you know, somehow still resid residually in me. Now, what happened to me, actually, in 2017, January, I moved from Florida to Wichita. And I went to my primary care and I said, I'm hallucinating. Like, I'll think the sidewalk keeps going, but it doesn't. Oh. And I'm blind. So I need to know. Or I'll be riding with a friend in the car and I'll ask him, is there a chain link fence in the median? No. Really, because I've been seeing one for miles and it's not there. We're in traffic. Okay, so, in so, so wait, are you blind at this point or going blind at this point or no? You're just hallucinating. Uh, at this point, I am I am blind. I'm 100% blind in my right eye. I can still see some things in my left eye. I okay. have about 70% vision. But I have a blind man cane. And I'm, but yeah, so I'm obviously I'm not driving on my way, but I can see a chain link fence. And I want to know if it's really there. And it's not. And I'm hallucinating. So I asked my doctor and she said, what year did you start taking acid? Is it when I was 12? She was, and you're about 50 now, 51 now. So she, that's about right. She was, I've heard that 40 years after you start, you'll have flashbacks. But I've never met anybody that had them. I went right here. Wow. So I, have, I, I, had, I had them at about 40 years, but 
I haven't had them since then. So how long did they last? It lasted about a year. Wow. And, and it was, um, the things that I saw was a chain link fence that was in the median for miles. It wasn't really there. I would see the sidewalk either keep going when it ends or it ends when it really keeps going. And one day we were in traffic in downtown Wichita and I asked the driver, is there an elephant in the road? And she's like, where? I said, in the cross, the cross street. She's like, no. I said, wow, I can see one. She's like, I wish I could see it. Like, <laughs> it's not pink or anything. It looks like a regular elephant. It's gray. Oh, man. Pink. It's not pink or anything. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, I gotta ask, where did you did all those people, these parents going back to the coven, did they go to your church? I mean, how did your parents know all these people? Were like, oh, I'll, here's the the mom with the kids that are, you know, having kitty porn in her house. Oh, I'll call your parents. How did they all know each other outside of the fact that it was a small town? Um, the woman that knew my parents that called my my mom or my dad to find out if I could stay lives one block like if you walked a block you'd be on her block okay and how she could see my house from her house um the and she worked at i think the cluiston inn which is um a big uh, it's owned by us sugar and it's a hotel they originally put it there so that when they had guests flown in for us sugar they could stay in their own hotel um, then, um, a lot of the deacons in my church were also members of the satanic coven. And then it, it being, I mean, we have probably about, I'm a guess between 3,500 and 5,000 people living in the town. It's not hard to know 150 of them. Right. Right. You know, the majority of them, I'd say a large number of them own a business in the town. So it wow. wasn't a stretch. But, you know, my dad did business with a lot of the business owners. And it's so funny because you're sitting here saying, hey, I got these people who are in my church. I can't do anything in my house. You've called your parents the no police before. Right. And yeah. here I am with these other parents who are letting me have sex with their children or training me to how, how to have sex. How, how did that square up or, or did you not even think about that at that age? I mean, I, I mean, it's a total dichotomy of life that you've well, got. But it does, it does eventually, it comes into play when, um, you know, I'm doing pretty much every sin under the sun and I'm, I'm, taking every drug known to man and I'm finding out that either my dad was wrong or he lied to me because I'm not addicted to alcohol. I don't feel like I'm addicted to drugs. I like taking them, but I don't feel addicted to anything. And none of them killed me. Oh yeah. Some of them put me to sleep, but I woke up, mm -hmm. you know, I, I didn't die. I didn't know D you know, I, I'm fine. You know, how wrong is my dad or was my dad lying to me? So I wouldn't take them. I mean, he's telling me that marijuana would kill me, you know? Yeah. Yes. Clearly not. And, um, you know, so I'm doing all this sex and drinking all this booze and taking all these drugs and I'm having a great time. And, you know, I'm doing sex at least on the weekends, but a lot of times during the week, you know, and I'm seeing one of the things that was heartbreaking, even back then, is that we would get lunch. We get a lunch break. So I'm eating peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I've got a bag of potato chips and some Oreos. And this girl is sitting there not eating anything. And she's just kind of like moving her legs back and forth or humming a tune. But sitting there quietly and she's not eating. 
And I asked her if she was hungry. And I offered her some chips. And she put her hands behind her back and she said she's not allowed to eat. And I looked at the girl that gave me the chips and everything. And I said, she's not allowed to eat. And she said, oh, she's, she was, she's been bad. So she's being punished by not eating. And when she's good, she'll be fed. And a lot of them were treated that way. There was one girl that was in so many scenes with me that I like really felt sorry for her not being able to eat. And I told her we were at a particular house and I said, we were talking and they asked me what I was talking about. And I said, we have three scenes coming up. And they're like, okay. And then, so I ran through the scenes really quickly with her. And then I said, so I didn't lie about that, but in the bathroom, the screen doesn't, isn't tacked in. So if I go out the to the screen? car, the screen window, the screen oh, in the window. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of like screen in the shower and the, you know, I forgot there could be windows in a bathroom. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, I can go out to the car and slip your food in through the screen window. All you have to do is five minutes after I walk outside, you go to the bathroom. So I told somebody I needed to get something out of the car. They're like, yeah, whatever. So I went outside and I started searching the entire car because I got to come up with something. What did I need to come out here for? Right. And then I saw the girl in the bathroom. I saw the hand come out of the screen. And I put... We had sandwiches in the car and I gave her a sandwich and she like shoved the whole sandwich in her mouth. And I think I gave her two sandwiches and she just pretty much drank them down and thanked me and pulled her hand back in. And then I went inside with like a book or something. And I said that there were positions in this book that I thought we could do in the film. And, um, and they bought that and the, um, the girl, you know, looked fine when I came out. She didn't have any food on her mouth or anything. And I knew that they wouldn't punish me, but they might punish her. Yeah. So what do you think they were doing? Was it always the girls that were getting punished? No, sometimes it was boys, too. Okay. But it yeah. was, I think that they wanted to keep them small. They wanted to keep them frail. Hmm. Um, and, and I think that they did use food to, to control them. Oh, that would make sense. I was just thinking of the whatever she did that was bad, as the other girl said, you know, what could that have been? I don't know. So okay. it, was probably, it was probably something in the um, sex area that she either didn't know how to do or refused to do. Yeah, that's so what that, I was thinking. But the other thing that happens, well, I was on an interview years ago and I was talking about how you can tell if a house is used in human trafficking. And so this woman called me and she said she saw me speak in Toronto and she wondered what could she record me? Because uh, she recorded me at the, the conference. But could she record me again on the phone telling about the house that I talked about? About how to tell what it looks like. And I said, okay, sure. I said, but they don't all look the same. This was just an example. I said, it was a flat house, one story, white. The windows are such that you can't see into them. Now, they either look like somebody's covered them with something or the drapes are right up against the windows. But you can't see through those windows. And then there's a fenced-in yard, and the fence could be 4 feet or it could be 12 feet. Now, the yard is pretty big, and the house is really big, and these white vans will show up. And the house either has a back door or a side door, and the van will show up and park with the side door of the van being flush with the side door of the building. 
and people will hmm. get in and out. They'll either get out of the van or into the van, and you can't tell how many there are because you're looking through this little gap of two or three inches. Even if you were standing right in front of it, you may not see it. But like a child things, trafficking kind of van, putting kids in and out kind of thing? Right, right. It'd be child trafficking and most likely child prostitution or child pornography. And so I said that. I said there's also going to be toys in the yard that have not been played with for ages. For example, you'll see a doll probably missing a head with an old dress on it. You'll see a ball that looks like no one has played with it in so long. If you touched it, it would collapse. And an old Tonka truck made of metal, completely rusted. Hmm. And she's like, okay, that's what I wanted. I'll call you back when I know something for sure. Okay. And I didn't think anything of it. And it was about a year later, maybe a couple of years later, this woman calls me and she tells me that she has a house in her neighborhood. She lives in the woods in Toronto and she lives in the woods with her, with her, I mean, they have a house in the woods and they pass this place every day and her and her husband went to my conference and then they've listened to that message over and over again. And they said, this house matches everything I say. They have the fence. They have the side door. They even have the three toys that I mentioned. It's the exact same three toys. Oh, my and goodness. And they live there all the time. And once in a while, they drive past, and there's the white van pulled up, and this is what's happening. So they contact the Canadian version of the FBI and tell them what there's what's happening. Apparently my talk was recorded in Toronto. So they play that form and they play the conversation we had on the phone. And this guy listens to that, goes into the woods and installs cameras in the trees. And then they contact a judge and they tell the judge, this is what this guy says. And he listens to what he said, what I'm saying while they're watching the video of the house, the yard, the fence, and the toys. And the judge is like, wow, down to the toys. Right. He's like, all right, this is the deal. I can write your warrant. But if you go and there's nobody there, it's probably going to be people get fired over this. He goes, if you go and you save some children and you arrest some pedophiles, you're going to be heroes. But remember, it might go the opposite way. So he gave them a warrant that was good, I think, for a few days. And they were watching their video. And they said, we got to hit it now. So they went and they hit it. They hit it from the woods and from helicopter teams coming down and from the front gate, just busting through it and parking in front of the van and raiding the house. That was on the news for one day. And it was something like 200 and something children were rescued and 20 something pedophiles were arrested in a satanic pedophile gang and then, and we called like all of our friends to let them know what happened because we heard it on the news. And we sent a lot of people links to it. And the next day, it was gone. Ah, I was even surprised that the Canadian FBI might not have been into it or something, but oh my gosh. Okay, keep going. Sorry. I just can't help but interrupt. And... Well, I mean, so it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. The, the, I mean, you might could search for it. I imagine they scrubbed it. Every time there's a story that involves Satanism, it disappears. Like if it had just been pedophiles and kids rescued, 
it'd probably still be there. But because Satanists were involved, they got rid of it. Yeah, Satanism going up to the top level. Oh my gosh, we haven't even covered how you even got in to this satanic organization. You're just a kid still, hanging out, eating your candy, well, having yeah. sex, doing drugs, you know? So, yeah. I, and I think we're going to have to do this in a in a two two part thing like two different days i thought we'd be able to get it all done in one but i'm just flabbergasted how time has flown with us talking it's already what is it 6 10 over here 6 20 yeah 6 20 so, so we're definitely still, not going to cover I can, I can talk for two hours and then we can just pick up where we left off all unless right. you can record longer i don't know if i can actually because i've got a I got to probably download it to my phone and that's the hard part or I get another right. laptop and, and do this. But so why don't we try to wrap it up at the top of the hour? Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, let, I love the act, this stuff that you're talking about because it's definitely not always in the other videos, but right. I know this part will be of how you actually got into it. And more specifically, um, I want to know the ritual too, because it definitely is anti-Catholic in my opinion, how, how they got you into this, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of like the black masses as we'll talk about later, but yeah. Tell right. me how, how did you quote unquote, sell your soul, even though you know now that you can't sell your, sell something that you don't own. And I hate to take your line from you, but go into that. Um, and how old were you 13 now at this age or were you a little bit older? It's important for that line to get out, no matter who says it. Because so many okay. people call me and say, I, I, I know you talk about divine mercy, but I sold my soul to the devil and I can't get it back. You know, it's like, uh, no, Satan lied to you. What you can do is give your will to the devil. Go to confession, you give your will back to God. So when I was 12 years old, this older kid came up to me. He was just running around playing joking around, pushing kids and saying stuff to them. And he runs up to me and he goes, you know, you're in a satanic coven, right? And he takes off running. <laughs> and I, laughed. I just laughed it off. Right. Just like you know? I would. Yeah. And, but then I thought, you know, one night I was at a sleepover here and I walked into the living room, was on my way to the bathroom and I saw a couple of people sitting in black robes with the cow raised wearing um a pentagram now, i wasn't really sure what a pentagram was it was an inverted pentagram but I, I read it in a book where um farmers were putting them on their 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 barns and they had a picture of one so i just knew about it from there and and they do it for luck for their crops and things. Oh. So I'm the inverted pentagram or a regular pentagram? The regular pentagram. Okay. So I see it on this thing. It's an inverted pentagram. I don't know the difference. And I don't know what this look is. I don't know why are they dressed like that. And I recognize them as regular members of my coven or of my group, not my coven. And yeah. So, but after a couple of weeks, it kind of bothered me, you know, like I saw those two people and then people sometimes pass me and they're whispering and I don't know, it just, something was different. Something was like, is this a satanic coven? Right. So I went up to a friend that I trusted and I said, hey, you're going to laugh. I heard something funny. It's crazy. I, and he goes, oh, what you got? I said, I heard this was a satanic coven. Crazy, right? <laughs> I'm expecting him to burst out laughing, you know, say, oh, get out of here, you know, whatever. But instead he said, it is. And my heart went, bloop. And I was like. How old was this kid? This kid was probably 16. 17. Okay. Now, now, the kid that I trusted, the guy that I trusted was an adult. 
the kid that told me was a kid, but the, the guy that I trusted was an adult. And oh, okay. So the kid who ran up to you and said, you know, you're in a satanic covenant and ran away was a kid. Right. And then the one that you asked was an adult saying, hey, this is pretty funny. Is this is I've heard that this is a satanic coven. So he was an adult. Thank you for clarifying that, because yeah. I thought it was another kid in the coven that you were talking to. Uh, it, was, it was an adult and he said it is. And my heart sunk into my stomach and I said, am I a member? No. Would you like to be? So, you know, here's the moment of truth. Because, you know, people ask me in my talks, didn't you know right from wrong? Didn't you know that you were doing bad stuff? Well, kind of. I mean, I didn't tell my parents. Hey, guess what? <laughs> I'm having sex this weekend. You're not I mean, with all, with all due respect there, Zachary, I was 42 years old doing some of that stuff as an adult, knowing what I was doing was wrong and still doing it. So, you know, give yourself a little slack as a kid i mean you're enjoying yourself you're not under right. the watch of the I'm no parents fun. you know i'm having fun i'm eating yeah. candy bars yeah. i'm eating like seven or eight candy bars a day i'm <laughs> having pizza almost every day i'm having mcdonald's or burger king almost every day you know i'm having whatever i want to eat and then i've got to go home and act like i'm hungry and eat whatever my mom fix <laughs> You know, and you know how I was able to do that? Because I smoked a joint before I went home. And, you know, I got the munchies and then I was able to eat again. You know, and, yeah. you know, I, I'm thinking about if I quit, what will I lose? I am addicted to porn. Yeah. I've got to see that every day. I was too. You've got to be 18 years old to buy porn. I'm 12. I like drinking. I don't feel that I'm an alcoholic, but I like it. And I like being able to pick up a bottle of whatever I want anytime I want. You've got to be yeah. 21 to buy booze. I'm still 12. And 19 to smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, smoke a cigar. Still 12. Yeah. And then I take illegal drugs that I get here. If I quit this, I'm not going to get these drugs. And then on top of all this, if I quit, all my sex goes away. And all the movies I'm in, I stop making. And I like having sex with all these people. Yeah, I had sex with the prettiest girls in school. Now, some of them don't go to my school. Some of them don't go to school at all, but they're all beautiful. You know, there's not an ugly girl there, and I'm mm -hmm. enjoying it. Kids, when I was 12 years old, all the boys at school bragged about all the sex they had that weekend, but none of them were having sex that weekend. It was 100 pies. You know, and if you ask them about that day, three weeks from now, they won't remember the lies they told. So they won't remember what they said. And you can catch them in all the lies. I did not brag on anything I did because I didn't want to be found out. Right. I didn't want somebody to find out he really is having sex. So I'm not bragging to anybody. But if I quit... I lose all my privileges and I like all my privileges. I like everything I'm doing, everything I'm getting, you know, as, as you know, as you said earlier, my parents were the no police, everything that I'm doing is stuff that my dad would have definitely told me. No, you know, yeah. they, they wouldn't let me go see the Moody blues. You know, that that's pretty innocent band to go see. They traveled with an orchestra. Um, so instead, the first band I went and saw was Blue Oyster Cult opening for Kiss. Because that's a much better show than the Moody Blues. <laughs> for sure. For sure. <laughs> and, uh, um, okay. So so that adult, okay, keep going. I was going to say, so that adult asks you, I mean, we. I think anyone that's watching this would understand why, uh, let me see, let me weigh out the scales. 
Yeah. But then again, it's Satan, you know, and you're this Baptist no. little boy, okay. you know. Here's what the Baptist church taught us. Jesus defeated the devil on the cross 2,000 years ago, and he's no threat anymore. Lie number one. And then lie number two, Satan is afraid of the Baptist church. So if you think you as a Baptist, that Satan is afraid of you, then maybe he's giving you everything you want because he's afraid of you. Ah. That's the logic of a 12-year-old. <laughs> and some adults. <laughs> and some adults. Because I'm sitting there thinking, well, if I was told that, I, I might believe that myself. Maybe some of the adults in your satanic coven thought the same thing who came from the Baptist faith. I don't, right. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. So I, I said, um, what do I have to do to join? It said there's 13 steps to joining a coven and you've done almost all of them already. Like, really? It says all you have left to do is to slice open your left thumb with a knife. Now it's left because it's closest to your heart. So you're going to slice your left thumb and bleed onto a document in three places and then sign that document in your own blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not yours. Jesus died for everyone, but not me. And on the final page of a five-page document, I agree to sell my soul to the devil. And I believed that I was selling my soul to the devil. And I'm 13 years old when I signed this document. And I believe pretty much if you were in a position of authority and told me something, I believed you. I believed the teacher when I was 11 years old that I would go to prison. I would be expelled from school. You know, I would be kicked out of my family. I would have to go get a job. Because she was the teacher. You know, and then, oh, and by the way, it did turn out that the woman that sexually assaulted me was in my cut. There was uh, a day when I think I was still 12, and I walked in and I saw her sitting down, and she asked me to come over and sit next to her, and I didn't want to. And I pulled back away from her and I ran away. And I left my coven and I didn't come back for a couple of weeks. And somebody came to me and asked me what, what, what happened? And I said, what happened? And I said, for me to agree to go back, she can't be there. I don't ever want to see her again. And they're like, okay, we'll take care of that. So I never saw her again. I don't know what happened to her. I don't know if she moved to a different coven or what she did, but I never had to see her again. Was she still a teacher? I don't know. It was traumatic. Oh, she just disappeared kind of thing? Well, at 12 years old, my dad took me out of public school and put me in private school. Oh, so okay. I stopped going. That was in the Clueston Middle School. I stopped going to that school. So I didn't know if she was still there or not. Got it. All right, so you sign this document, but then there was like an, a, a ritual also, right? Yes, yeah, so I, I meet everybody at a farmhouse. That's where we're having a sleepover that night. And there's a separate room that has children in it that are like 12 and younger. And all they're doing is trying to stay awake till 3 a.m. And if somebody is able to stay awake till 3 a.m., they get a special prize. Now, it's a decent prize. It'd be like an Atari console or something like that. All they got to do is stay awake till 3 a.m. But usually nobody makes it. Um, we were going to do um, a black mass, but uh, an extended black mass. And I had never done one, so I wasn't really part of the Black Mass. We had a group of women swaying on the floor, nude, chanting our bodies ourselves. 
And by the time the abortion took place, uh, their eyes were completely black and they were, uh, they looked full on possessed. There's a group of men in the room in their robes and they're saying prayers to Satan to keep the police at bay and make sure that nobody invades us. And then we've got 13 high priests and priestesses surrounding a birthing table and an abortion doctor and abortion nurse there and all the equipment that they need to do their job. Now, I had been told when I was 14 years old that I was going to participate in um, my first abortion. Oh, I'm combining two events here. Sorry. I, I was I was going to interrupt you. I'm like, wait a minute. You, the, the ritual of you getting into the yeah. thing was 13. Okay. The robe, the white robe, the black robe. But I ended up skipping ahead. Yeah, I ended up skipping ahead. Didn't mean to. Okay. That's okay. I've said this story 200 times, so. I am not, no doubt. Trust me. I, I watched <laughs> probably all of them. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, so. So, so we're going uh, back signed, to after you sign the, the document yeah, to quote unquote document, sell your soul. Okay. And, and uh, you're 13. Quote, uh, right, and I'm 13 years old. And um, they bring me into a room that has this giant vat it looks like a demon's head and I'm wearing a white robe signifying I'm losing my innocence. You climb into the, the demon's head and it's filled with human blood, pig's blood and human urine and you're fully submerged in it. They bring you back up. You go into another room and you take a shower and you come out in a black robe with the cow raised signifying you've been baptized into a world of darkness. You sit in a chair and you're handed a crucifix inside of a wheel and you spin the crucifix upside down, signifying human sacrifice. You put your arm, your hands on the arms of Jesus and you break the arms downward, denouncing Christ. And then what you're left with looks like a peace sign and they take your document which they read off to everybody. You show them your thumb to show them that you sliced into your thumb, and then they intertwine this document with the crucifix, and they tell you that it's gonna be forever locked there, and now you're gonna celebrate, you're gonna have an orgy and celebrate that you're now a Satanist. But the reality is, you're celebrating that one day you're gonna die and go to hell. Yeah. And then we have a yeah. big orgy, and then that's it, I'm officially a Satanist. Wow. Oh, and that might be a great opportunity now. Oh, no, we can. Okay. So then a year later, I'm looking at the clock. We got 20 minutes. So okay. then another year later, we can get into that other story that you started talking about. How did you get into that? Well, at 14, I was told that I was going to participate in an orgy. And it was going, and orgies were no big deal because I've been on in orgies on video a lot. And so it's going to be all the male members, 12 to 15, and a female member that's 19 years old. And she's what's called a breeder. And she's already had one or two abortions. And the purpose of her getting pregnant is, and, and to have an abortion nine months later. And I said, cool. And then I went home and looked up the word abortion because I didn't know what it meant. And my dictionary was so old, it didn't have the word in it. I went to the library and I found two books that were both about this thing that had abortion in the title. I was like, you know, I got through school on Cliff Notes. I am not reading two inches of a book to find out what one word means. So... I went back to somebody that I trusted and asked. Um, I was told I have to do an abortion in nine months, but I uh, don't know what that means. He goes, oh, you're killing a baby in the womb. I was like, is that legal? Oh yeah, in the womb legal, out of the womb murder. Okay, what do I do? So he said, get a ball of Play-Doh and maybe an apple and an orange and practice stabbing it with scissors or a scalpel, we'll give you a scalpel. And you just practice stabbing that 
And then I was told by somebody else that it's just a lump of cells. It's just some tissue. It's not a fully formed baby. Don't worry about it. You're not going to see an actual baby. But, okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, by the way, is this that guy that that same adult that you trusted that you asked about? Hey, am I in a coven or a satanic coven? Yeah. Is this the same, same guy? guy? Okay. So nine months later, we're at this event. We have uh, a group of women nude on the floor, swaying, chanting our bodies ourselves. The group of men dressed in robes, saying chants and prayers to keep uh, the devil keeping us safe. Uh, 13 high priests and priestesses surrounding the table. Um, we had a Baphomet statue back then but it didn't look like the Baphomet statue that the Satanic Temple has now. Uh, that's created by a, a new artist. We had our own version of a Baphomet statue. And so, then, so for those who don't know what who Baphomet is, can you explain that to the audience? Uh, their Baphomet statue that they have is, it has a female arm and a male arm so it's supposed to represent androgyny, and it has a penis in it, in it where, it's, where a penis would be, but it also has female breasts, and one arm has a finger pointing down to somebody, and then the other arm is pointing upward to the moon of something else. You know, and it's, it, it's such a bizarre thing, because there are an atheistic satanic coven. So they don't even believe in God or, or Satan. So they've kind of like invented what all these terms are, but they don't believe in anything they're worshiping. And to a theistic satanic coven, this represents Satan. So this isn't the Baphomet half goat, half human kind of thing. It's different. Right. Obviously. Right. It's quite a it, it was quite a bit different back then as well. It just wasn't that representation. Um, if you look at, um, there's a there's a description of the Baphomet, but I think you have to go on the Satanic Temple's website to get the description. And, and I don't know how many Catholics would be willing to go to the Satanic Temple's website. Right, right, no doubt. And it's child yeah, it sacrifice to this god or whatever this is, right. this Baphomet thing, to your coven that doesn't believe in God or Satan. But Well, my coven actually did believe in God. They just didn't exactly believe in the God of the Bible. You know, we were a theist. Both, both the covens I belonged to were both theistic. They believed in God. They believed in the actual God and an actual Satan, and they believed in demons and angels, but and they believed you could sell your soul to the devil. Okay, I think I'm confused. <laughs> and okay, that's not that's surprising. The question you need. <laughs> okay, so if it's Baphomet, um, and then what you said just a moment ago, that it was that they didn't believe in God or Satan, or is that Baphomet? I, I, that's where I'm confused. I got that's, lost in the... the... The Satanic Temple is the one that has Baphomet, and they don't believe in God or Satan. Okay. The Satanic Temple is atheistic. Okay. But you both, coven. covens, both of my covens that I belong to were both theistic. They believed in God. They believed in Satan. But they believed okay. in a different Satan and God than what's represented in the Bible. Have you ever heard of the joy of Satan? No. Oh, that just gave me the creeps. No, I haven't. <laughs> the joy of Satan um, is another satanic coven. They're probably in the top five largest covens in the world. And their job is to destroy the Catholic Church from the inside. They get jobs inside the Catholic Church and then use Discord to split them up. Mm -hmm. And they believe, if you go on their website, 
they have a whole manifesto about who Satan is and who God is. And in their manifesto, Satan is the good guy and God is the bad guy. And they give lots of examples from the Old Testament showing God being the bad guy. Wow. The joy of Satan. It's a new one on me. So there's the top five covens, I would think, would be uh, Anton LaVey's uh, Satanic Church of Satan, uh, World Church of Satan, which was my second coven, the OTO, Cordae Templi Orianti. They're probably the third largest at this point. Uh, the Satanic Temple, which is probably the second largest, and the Joy of Satan, which is probably fifth. The OTO at one time was the largest. And then they're also worldwide. Um, according to the Satanic Temple, you know, most of their members, by most, I mean 90% of their members are transgendered. Hmm. Yeah, we're going to get odd. into that. Well, Go ahead. Satan doesn't have a sex. So it looks like he's trying to make the satanic temple all like him. Sex right. Sex. Or right. I, you know, that's a great way to, that's an interesting, I should say, way to look at it. Cause I would think, well, he just wants to not have human beings procreate by cutting off certain things that, you know, or, and well, taking all these hormones and drugs. And are, are you familiar with how they switch things? Or do you know how they switch things? Because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people think that they're going to add an appendage where they didn't have one before. Right. Or eliminate an appendage that they have now. And that's yeah. not the twisted way they do things. If you're a female, I'm going to use medical terms. Is that okay on your podcast? Absolutely. I think we're all... Well, most of us should be adults watching this. And if if they're medical terms, then we should all know medical terms, right? Okay. So if you're a female and you want a penis, they don't actually give you a penis. They give you hormone therapy and they enlarge your clitoris. Correct. And it's like, that is so twisted. How does that make you a man? <laughs> It doesn't. Oh and I'm just sitting here owning one of those things and thinking, how do you <laughs> make this into that? Right. I mean, OK, here I am I've been using the terms and I'm saying we're all adults, but it's I don't even understand how that's possible. And it would be well, painful. Well, what has happened is that a hundred. Now, this was according to like, I don't know, it's the CDC. Pew survey. I, I don't know where it came from. But the stat is 100% of the people that get the surgery regret it within five years. And then at that point, they realize they weren't happy with what they were before. And they're still not happy, even though they changed. So they either change back because at least that's their natural state or they kill themselves Correct. because they're happy before they're not happy now nothing makes me happy i'm gonna die so sad and then for the okay so let's flip it tell me what do they do with the men then because i've heard some crazy things with with what they have to do I after heard, they i have heard some crazy things uh, one of the things I heard is that you take estrogen and it makes your equipment stop working. Like you can urinate through it, but you can't uh, procreate with it. Um, but I have heard that they form your penis to look like a vagina and that they also put a slit inside your torso and then your penis is in your torso. And I'm like, oh. that, can't, that can't be healthy. And that can't feel good either. <laughs> I mean, again, you have yours, I have mine. We're both like, ow, like, are you kidding? Yeah. Uh, and I understood that like that there's constant, like you have to 
put stuff in there to keep it not close up. And I, again, sorry, people who are watching this, if you're getting grossed out, but this is the, this is evil in my humble opinion, this whole thing that is going on out there that you, you just cannot rewrite God's creation. You can't. And yeah. it is a business. I was, um, Oh my gosh, my mother's going to kill me because she just told me to watch her. She has done so much studies, something Billick, I think. Um, she's got the receipts. Let's just say that she's she's showing and proving that this is a business. Like people from like Jeff Bezos are are investing in this technology, this medical technology that's supposed to help people be the other sex. So there's this whole evil business around this whole thing too i've heard it's that it cost about eight hundred thousand dollars to do and that the government is willing to pay for it i'm like this is why we're going broke. yeah go woke oh my gosh oh hang on i gotta look at the time because i think we got 10 minutes left and we're getting into some cool stuff. So this is maybe a good teaser for the next one because I'm just, I'm just telling you, man, I've got th three full pages of questions and we've skimmed some of it. Um, but I think that this is okay. One more thing that I want to ask before we wrap up. So, because now you're, you've joined the coven quote unquote officially, even though again, you can't sell something you don't have. Um, oh, where was I just going with this? Oh, are you still doing magic at this time? You know, you were saying that you were doing it a lot when you were not in this coven or you didn't meet these people. And what is it that you're, what are, what kind of spells are you doing? I, I am full on addicted to magic. I have to do at least one magic spell a day. I usually do a simple spell when I wake up, and it may be simple as there's a certain girl at school that I find really pretty, but she's not in any of my classes, and I would like to see her every day. And I would do okay. a spell for that. And then every day I would see her. Now, if I, I experimented, if I didn't do the spell, I didn't see her. If I did the spell, I saw her. That's so I knew good. it was okay. magic. Give you me know, a couple more. I, when I ran out of money, eventually I ran out of my thousand bucks. I did another spell. Every time I did a spell, I would either be, I would either find money or somebody would just walk up to me. Nobody knows I'm doing these spells. I do it. I've got a private bathroom in my bedroom. And nice. I do a magic spell in the, in the bathroom. And then two or three days later, some random stranger walks up to me and hands me a hundred bucks. And I don't know who he is. He's not in my coven. I have no idea who he is, but he just gave me a hundred bucks. Wow. You know, or somebody gives me 10 bucks or five bucks. I, I wasn't partial. I wasn't trying to buy a car, you know, so I wasn't saving up my money to see what I could get. You know, I was just, Let's see what happens now. Hmm. You know, I, I need some money. Let's do a spell for cash. Got you know, I, I, did, I, did, I did spells on occasion for hard tests that I studied for the test, but I do not know it well enough to make an A. But can I make an A? Can I make a B? I'd be happy with an A or a B. And then I would make like a B minus. I'm fine with that because I didn't know it well enough to get a B minus. Right. Right. By the way, we never did finish that abortion thing. So I think that'd be good to you described the women on the floor, the 13 high priests. Now, did you actually do the abortion or how did that all work? And well, why again were you doing that? Was it to to get more power? There was a city official that tried to pass something legally and no matter what he tried nothing worked and he contacted my coven 
gave my coven uh, money. I don't know how much money, but gave it money to do a hex. And a hex comes with an abortion. So we were doing it for this guy to get this hex done and for him to get whatever it was he was wanting passed to get it passed. And, you know, we don't give guarantees, but if you're going to do a hex, you get a better chance than if you just do a regular spell. When you do a regular spell, you've got like a 50-50 shot. Might work, might not. But if you give Satan something he wants, he'll give you something you want. The unfortunate thing is, it's not fair. And even if Satan gave you a billion dollars, is it worth it that you had to murder a baby to get it? Right. Now, right. these people would say yes. Because it's just a baby in the womb, who cares? You know, it's one baby in the womb and I get a billion dollars. Totally fair. Right. But me being Catholic, not fair at all. Not even close to fair. So if we get ready to do the abortion um, and the doctor delivers breach and delivers everything but the head, it's a late term abortion. Do you know what that is? Yes, it's almost ready to be born. So I don't know what the month it is that it needs to be post, but it's close to nine months. I mean, I think you had the orgy right. with the girl and then nine months later, there she was, right? Right. Like giving birth? Kind of? Basically, yes. It's supposed to be an abortion, but um, he delivers the baby all but the head. Do you want the description of the late-term abortion or do you just want me to say she had a late-term abortion? Yeah. Yeah. She had a late-term abortion. I hear my mother in my head <laughs> saying, don't, don't get to the details. Okay, so, okay. yeah. So she had a late-term abortion. And at that time, I realized that I was lied to. It is not a lump of cells. It is not some tissue. We are not scraping something out or vacuuming out a little baby that nobody can see. It's yeah. full-term. Yeah. This baby would have been fine. If they'd have delivered it, it would have lived. And so they murder the baby, and then they dismember the baby and throw it out to the women on the floor who cannibalize it. Everything but the bones. So this, then, I mean, geez, it's, it's warm flesh, blood everywhere, and these women on the floor are writhing and what were they saying again? My body, myself or something? Our bodies, ourselves. Our bodies, ourselves. So my body, my choice. I wonder if right. we're women out there, not me, but I, I mean, my body, my choice. Is that like a satanic chant or something like these women are doing on the ground? I don't know. Sounds like very familiar. To and me. they were, they, they all looked possessed when they did it. After they had consumed everything, then they had this, that they're all covered in blood and they all did an orgy. <laughs> oh and then we all took our showers and then we all went home. This was a Saturday night. So we all went to our homes and so we could get ready to go to church. Oh my gosh. I mean, I hate to laugh like that, but it's so like unbelievable. Like, wow. So did this not blow your mind? Were you... I, I How was this you? And well, unfortunately for me, I felt 10 foot tall and bulletproof because I just participated in a murder and realized that this was legal. Do you realize that I could do this every day? If I was an abortionist, I could do this every day, consecrate all of them to Satan, and I'd be the richest man in the world because Satan would be giving me everything I want. And I'd be consecrating all the dead babies to Satan. And at that time, I thought about becoming a doctor so I could be an abortionist. Because okay. money was really okay. important to me. And mm -hmm. I thought this would be amazing. That is where we're going to cliffhang this because I'd like you to cover abortion, satanic rituals, 
I truly believe it's evil. And I also have to admit to everyone before we hang up this call um, or this video, I guess, I totally believe the culture, my body, my choice. If I got pregnant as a teenager, I would never want to tell my parents, which by the way, any teenagers that that's watching this, tell your parents they, you know, they're not the, the worst people in your life. They are going to help you through this. I, I just totally believed in the culture and I only had my little tidbits. What was it? My body, my choice. What about incest? What about rape? You know, those types of things. And no guy should tell me what to do with my body. I, thank God I never had to make the choice. If somebody is watching this show and they live somewhere in Florida, there's a guy there that has a pro-life ministry named Mark Hall. And Mark Hall is in the Melbourne, Florida area. And using my methods, uh, they shut down two abortion mills there. And he will fly anywhere in the country. The Knights of Columbus will fly him. And he will do whatever it takes so that you don't abort your child. And including, he will put you in a place to stay. It will get, get you a job. It will let you stay someplace for free. He will pay it. His ministry has a lot of money because of somebody making a million dollar donation to his ministry. Where oh. their, their, their daughter was going to get an abortion and they were in favor of it. And the day she was supposed to have the abortion, the parents won lotto. And they called her and said, we don't want our grandchild murdered. And they found out where she was being held that, you know, she had a benefactor and they found out about his ministry and gave him a million dollars. Wow. That is amazing. And we so have has, to talk about this. He has a, uh, a motor home that has a technician in it that does ultrasounds. And then he stands out in front of abortion mills with a megaphone and tells people, if you come over here and get an ultrasound done of your baby, we'll give you a hundred dollar bill. No questions asked, no high pressure salesman, nothing. You just come over and get it done. I'll give you a hundred dollars. So girls come over, get it done. And they can see that it's an actual baby in their belly. And then he gives them a hundred dollar bill. And he says the majority of the time they don't get the abortion. Amazing. And that's Abby Johnson, right? When she first saw that the ultrasound, when that doctor was ripping the limbs off of the child and she was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> one of the highest directors in Planned Parenthood. So we'll leave it at this. And I do want to talk about the culture and the messaging and the evil that, that I truly believe is surrounding this. It's about money. It's about selling parts. It's about offering it perhaps to Satan. Maybe there are quite a bit of satanic abortion doctors and or people at the at the actual building. And I know you've said, hey, it's anybody, even the people that are mowing the lawn to make the place look good. Like we're all culpable in some way, shape or form if we're supporting Planned Parenthood. And we have to look at the corporations that are giving money to Planned Parenthood that we buy stuff from. I mean, it's a, the web is wide. Let's just say that. And I, I see right. Satan right in the middle. Okay. So that being said, we're going to end this and we will have to get back together. I don't know when you're available. I know tomorrow I can't. Um, and then there's Easter and I want you to enjoy your Easter. So anytime next week. Honey, but next week, when am I available? <laughs> I don't have any other interviews. Just on Monday. In the evening. Okay. I have an interview on Monday in the evening.